Father, we thank you for your grace and for your love and for the privilege that you've given us to study and worship together on this channel. May these truths grip our hearts so that we rejoice in our position in Christ. May the Holy Spirit direct what is spoken here so that our Lord receives the praise, all the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. I'm going to take a, a short pause from our study in Ruth to talk about the 17th chapter of John. I've had some questions about it, and so we're going to just take a quick look at that, and then we'll go back to our study in Ruth. I hope that you find this video a real blessing and encouragement. These are certain, certainly for a fact, these are, uh, well, just you know, for lack of a better expression, they are very interesting times that we are passing through. It's always been my deepest heart's desire that believers everywhere come to realize the blessings that they have in Christ. We are faced today, just as the early Christians were in the first century, with a religious system, a world religious system that is based on human merit. And so many Christians are caught up in that system, which does not provide the peace and the comfort and the joy that the Lord provides. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about John 17. There's no way that in this short video, I can really do justice to the entire chapter. But I'd like to introduce you to at least seven, if not eight, assurances that we can see in that chapter regarding our, the, what some have come to call uh, the high priestly prayer of Jesus Christ. We're talking about our Lord and Savior, His prayer to the Father. And if, if we don't see folks right from the very outset, if we don't acknowledge the fact that who, of, of who it is that is doing the praying, exactly who it is that is speaking here to the Father, and how that it, God of very God, incarnate in human flesh, God, in, in a very real sense, God speaking, praying to the Father who is God. God speaking to God. And take a serious look at what just what Christ prayed. And then ask ourselves, was His prayer answered? Could it have not been answered? That's the question that I, I hope that uh, to address in this video. When God created, He created time. And one of the, the great gifts, the greatest gifts that we have from God is time. Twice we are told in His Word that we should redeem the time. So we have the promise of the Holy Spirit that when that time is used for the Lord, it will produce results. So I think as we begin to, to approach what m just very well might be our final year here, I want to give you seven or, or at least seven, perhaps eight assurances that we have from the Lord from the 17th chapter of John. Now think for a moment that Jesus Christ is not some man that was born in Bethlehem at Judea some 2,000 some odd years ago, but God Himself who came and dwelt among us. The Lord that we worship, the Lord that we know, is the sovereign God of, of all eternity. He always was. And He became our kinsman, redeemer, taking on flesh so that He might be our substitute and redeem us totally apart from anything of ourselves, totally paying the price. 
when you stop to think that he's God in the flesh, then it is inconceivable, it is impossible that Christ would pray or could pray anything that was not God's will. And it's astounding how many sermons are preached on Christ's prayer in the garden that he'd like to get out of the cross. We have the testimony of Scripture. So I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Are we going to say that he came to do the will of the Father and now he wants to get out of it? The, the point that I'm simply making here is that what Christ prayed has to be God's will. More than that, it must come to pass. It is inconceivable that he as God could pray anything that was not God's will. And if it is God's will, it must, must, must come to pass. In the second verse of the 17th chapter, he says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. The prayer begins in verse 1. I'm only quoting verse 2. Eternal life. We have eternal life. Eternal life isn't something that you can throw away. It's not like a baseball that you can throw away. It's... It's life that never ends, no matter what the circumstances are. You have eternal life with God. That is absolutely God's will in Christ. In the 10th verse, he prays, And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. So, he's glorified in some, some of us, right? But, but not in my rotten life, Steve. You know, he can't be glorified. Maybe he is in some uh, believers, but not in mine. Folks, you can't do that with, with our Lord's Prayer, that he's glorified more in some than others. You can't do that with that verse. Every single one of you are justified, made righteous in Christ, precious to Christ. Christ is glorified in us. I'm going to try to put these up on the screen, and I would ask that you print this out, write these down or whatever, and just and stick it to your fridge. The ones that he is praying about here belong to God, and they belong to Christ. God knew them before the foundation of the world. Christ died in their place. What is God's is Christ's, and what is Christ's is God's. We don't belong to the world system. We don't belong to Satan. And we don't belong to ourselves. We're His. And every one of us is precious to God. We were bought with a price. In the 11th verse, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to Thee, Holy Father. Keep through, through thy own, Thine own name those whom Thou hast given Me, that they may be one as we are. That's his prayer. We are one in Christ. I don't, know, I don't know how many times over the years someone's asked me to get involved in some movement so that we all might be one as Christ prayed. Wouldn't it, wouldn't, wouldn't it just be nice if Christ's prayer was answered? Folks, it was. If Christ's prayer was not answered, then it is not the will of God. We have the testimony of Scripture that if you ask anything according to the will of God, we will receive it. Now, no human effort on our part is going, is, is going to make us one. No effort on our part where we try to come up with some kind of an agreement, you know, that, that all are willing to compromise enough to accept it, which will make us one. We are one because we're His. We're not one because we act like it. We're not one because we look like it. We're not one because we've agreed to get together and try to be one. We are one because we are His. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. We're not only one, but we are kept. Guarded is the word in, in the Greek. We are guarded by God. If you're not guarded, then Christ's prayer was not answered. 
Verse 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Not keep them from evil, keep them from the evil. It's articulated. It's, it's amazing how many preachers try to come up with sermons to make sure that you're kept from evil. Yeah, we'll, we'll try to work out some way the way that you live your life and the things that you do so that you'll be kept from evil and you'll bring glory to the Lord. And I've never heard one of them, not one, not one of them refer to the 15th verse of the 17th chapter of John. Christ's prayer to the Father was that you be kept from the evil. Do you suppose you will be? And just so that you know, that is that is articulated, the evil. That, does, that is not, here's what it is not saying. That is not saying that some evil person can't cause you harm. But that God will keep you from the, a very particular evil. And I believe that has to do with doctrine. Doctrinal deception. Since Christ prayed that you be kept from the evil, do you suppose that He'll do that? Folks, we are, this is why we're called believers. If you do not believe these truths, I hardly see how that you can call yourself, yourself a believer. Now, you may be a believer, but you may be a believer who's not believing. You can trust God that what He said is true, that what He prayed is true, that, what the, Father, that the Father answered His prayer, all of His prayer, every bit of it, every word. Here's a promise that you will be kept from, that is ek in the Greek, out of the evil. But Steve, you don't know how much I sin. I, I don't want to know that. If you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, you are kept from the evil. The 17th verse, I pray that you sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And there's a tremendous move in Christianity today that you need to sanctify yourself. And there is not one single passage of Scripture that ever exhorted you to sanctify yourself. It is always God who does it. The Apostle Paul says, I pray, God, that your whole body, soul, and spirit be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. And I hear that quoted a lot. And you, you know the next verse, Faithful is He that calls you who also will do it. He will do it. Christ prayed that you be sanctified, set apart by God as holy. That God set you apart for Himself. What a marvelous, marvelous truth. Do you suppose He did that? Jesus Christ, God Almighty, incarnate in human flesh, prayed for something that didn't happen? You are not only guarded from the evil, you are set apart to God. In the 23rd verse, again he's praying, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. We are perfect, complete in Christ. That doesn't mean that you're perfect and that you don't sin. What it means is you have been made complete in Christ. All we have to do is move to Colossians. You are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. Now, you don't look that way, but you are. There's absolutely nothing, nothing that needs to be done. As far as you're concerned, in God's presence, you are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. This is how God looks at you. God would love them as He loved Christ. We are loved by God. How much do you suppose God the Father loved God? Love them as thou hast loved me. Think of it. That Almighty God loves you as He loves the incarnate Christ. And in the 24th verse, Father, I will that they also whom Thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which Thou hast given me. For Thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. There again is scriptural testimony to the deity of Jesus Christ 
as well as the security of the believer. Think of it. I also pray, and it's my will, that they be with me. We will be with Christ in glory. I can't imagine how many sermons are preached on, on, on what you've got to do to make sure that you're going to go to heaven, that, to make sure that you're going to be with Him. Folks, listen to me. Dearly beloved, these are tremendous verses of comfort. Why would you want to take your minds off of Christ and put them down here in the garbage pit of which, uh, uh, in which you live? This is a testimony of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what He's done for you. I'm not suggesting that you don't have any responsibilities, but all of those responsibilities, folks, are all vested in love. Not your love for Him, but His love for you. These are at least eight tremendous truths that can be gleaned from the 17th chapter of John. I'd love to spend more time in it, but we need to finish up Ruth. And I have uh, been seriously considering beginning after Ruth a study through the book of Revelation chapter by chapter, which should take us into spring, May of 2021. Lord willing, that is what we will do. So here are tremendous truths that are that are yours. They, they belong to you, not only for the rest of 2020, but for the coming year and beyond if, if, if we are still here. They must be true because they are the will of the Lord. They must be true because our Lord and Savior, who was God in the flesh, prayed and he, this was his prayer to the Father, and it had to have been answered. Folks, this is why we're called believers. You can believe in these truths, rest in these truths. These truths give comfort and joy to our soul. Look, I love you all, I truly do. I want to thank you for your continued prayers for the direction of this ministry. I pray for all of you constantly. I know many of you are going through difficult circumstances, but it's the very truths that I've spoken about here that can carry you through those difficult times. I'm praying for you constantly. Thank you for all of your comments, your kind, warm, encouraging comments on YouTube, Facebook. I thank you all for your support. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.